Welcome everyone to the uh, CG 2020 annual conference webinar on governing public and private higher education in the UK and beyond. And this is part of our, our um, conference paper series, which we're running on Tuesdays during this and next month. Um, we've got two broad topics for you today. The first one is about private higher education, primarily in the UK, although there's some comparative work has been done during this project. The second half hour will be spent on governance. And again, looking at the UK, but also looking at Europe as well. Um, now both of these um, presentations are arising out of project work, which has been done over a four year period in each case. Uh, and the project's not finished yet, but there's already been one major uh, book out of the governance project and more on the way and a um, number of articles and papers from both projects. Um, I'll, I'll introduce our presenters, I think at the beginning of each segment, but we're going to, you're going to hear today from uh, Steve Hunt on private um, higher education and Jürgen Inders and Aniko Horvath on governance. So um, to begin with Steve, Steve's been working as a research associate in the Centre for Global Higher Education since early 2016. And he's really carried the research work on private higher education and produced papers for the Department uh, of Education, as well as um, academic um, conference papers, uh, journal articles and working papers coming out of this project. Um, Steve uh, is a quantitative researcher who's now doing work, which you'd call also qualitative and policy related and it's been the policy emphasis of this project, which has been particularly interesting for all of us. Um, before I open with Steve, I'll just take you through the web protocols and just give me a moment to bring the, the information up on screen. So please note that the um, webinar is being recorded and will be posted online on the CG website soon after the finish of the webinar. It usually takes about 24 hours. A transcript of the chat function um, during the webinar will also be posted as well. Please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but please do turn it on when asking a question. We recommend using speaker view so that you, you can more clearly see who is talking. You can ask questions during the webinar um, or at the end of the presentation, but normally what we do is we take the questions as they come in through the chat function and that enables me to identify the questions. We get many questions and we like to ensure we have a good spread across the world and in relation to different topics. So uh, you can use the raise, raise hand function if you wish, but primarily I think focus on putting your question into the chat function. When you're invited to ask a question, uh, please unmute yourself, most important, switch on your video and state your name and where you are from. So at this point, it's, it's my delight to hand over to Steve Hunt. Okay, thanks Simon. Right, I hope everyone can see my first, first slide. I'll be talking about the private higher education landscape in the UK, great, thanks. Um, and this, the private higher education uh, sector uh, in the UK has received quite a lot of attention in recent years, uh, but relatively little is known about it, um, certainly compared to the uh, public sector. And in this presentation, we, that's Vicky Bolivar and I, are going to examine the reasons for this situation and present some of our findings relating to the UK's private HE sector. Um, 
So why has the UK's private HG sector received such attention? It's principally because the UK government is keen to grow private provision of the HG sector with um, plans set out in its um, white paper, Success as a Knowledge Economy, um, which we can see the front page of on this, uh, in the centre of, uh, of this slide. Um, in it, private providers are framed as challenger institutions, which um, by enhancing competition with the public sector are expected to, to drive up standards, um, increase choice, and make economies in the pr provision of education. And these savings could then be passed on to students who, at least in England, now pay for their higher education through tuition fees. So that's the policy context and the reason why the uh, private HE sector is receiving this attention. Um, the practical motivation for the research that we conducted is that, there, is that it's hard to know whether the private providers uh, are well placed to fulfill the role envisioned for them uh, by the UK government. This is because the UK private HG sector remains a largely unknown quantity. And as researchers, we face two problems. Uh, the first is that there's no official system of registration for private providers, HG providers, and nor is there any alternative reliable record of private providers operating in the UK. So the first problem we were presented with when we tried to uh, examine what the, H, the private HE sector was. And we solved this problem uh, by constructing our own database by means of a trawl of operating private providers' websites. We built up a data set composed of uniform information across the sector concerning uh, features of private providers such as their location, their legal status, the kind of subjects they taught, the qualifications they offered and the associations they might have had might have with external bodies such as universities or professional associations. So from this we get a descriptive account of the sector um, indicating its scale and scope. Um, and so for example we can uh, no, we know, for example, that it numbers through this research about 800 providers. Um, given that situation, the second methodological problem we faced was that um, the private sector is not subject to any universal external regulatory forces imposed on it, such as governing laws or systems of funding and accountability, which are found in the public sector. There's no apparent equivalent organizational structure in the private HE sector. Um, and as a consequence, it exhibits a much greater diversity than you might find in the public sector. So when I mentioned earlier on, we gathered data on the legal status of the uh, providers. Um, we, we, can, we know, for example, that it's a sector that includes charitable organizations, for-profit companies, and also registered not-for-profit companies. But given this, we only really have access to a series of descriptive frequencies, you know, such as how many are located in particular areas of the UK and with what frequency particular subjects are taught, but no real idea of how the sector is organised. And this problem we addressed mm -hmm. by um, taking our data set and applying to it a particular statistical test called latent class analysis. This we did in an effort to integrate the elements identified in the survey, like location, subjects, qualifications. And so we could use that to provide an indication of the structure of the sector in terms of underlying groups of providers based on statistical relationships or communalities um, between the various elements in the database. So we were doing that rather than reading off um, a structure by describing the external forces that might have been imposed on it, as you could do with the public sector. 
Okay, so this isn't a cross of uh, St. George. What I'm going to show you here is the results or examples of the results of our analysis. So we applied it to about 800 providers. And the results of this statistical test indicate the best fit was a four class solution. Which we should get. An example. Here in the top hand corner. So the first class accounted, in fact, for about 50% of all providers. And what they have in common, what their features they show in common, and these aren't logical groupings, these are statistical trends. So it's not that they absolutely have to have all of these, it's that they basically all fall into this group more or less. But what they showed along these lines is that this large sector, and for about half of all the providers we found, is that they're generally for profit, but it's mainly, mainly offer sub-degree provision, particularly in business and IT. And they're often located outside London and are often quite recently founded. So by recently, I mean perhaps in less than 10 years or less. And this, this is an example of one. It's uh, located in Manchester, which is a large city in the north of the UK, north of England. Uh, and it's a, a business school effectively offering principally sub-degree uh, courses. That means ones that occur below the degree level, which you might use to gain interest to a degree eventually. But it's basically not dealing with undergraduate bachelor degrees. Let's take a look at the second. I've got my... This is a provider called the Bloomsbury Institute. Um, and this uh, second type accounts for about a quarter of all providers. And they're quite similar to the first group in several respects, but they show a greater concentration on more advanced subjects at degree and postgraduate level. And uh, they also show a greater concentration in London. <clears throat> and we're that's certainly true of the Bloomsbury Institute and this was recently attempting to apply for degree awarding powers on its way presumably to becoming a recognized university and before I finish we'll return to the Bloomsbury Institute so it's worth keeping that in mind um, now let's have a look at the third and we might as well move on also to include the fourth type of provider please about basically account for about an eighth of their sample each. And these tend to be not-for-profit and often charitable institutions, particularly in the third group. They're often highly specialized, often concentrating on postgraduate provision. Um, they tend to be much older and concentrated again in London and the Southeast. The Royal Academy of Arts was founded in 1768. So it's not the case that all uh, private providers are new. Um, despite the fact they're often presented as uh, new institutions, the RA belongs to it and it's a, a long established educational provider, although its intake is absolutely minute. But it's, it offers you an example of the diversity in the sector as well. And in the fourth group, which I said shares many features, um, it's a group that contains all the recognized private universities of which there are four, I think there are five and then there are four recognized uh, university colleges, those are both have to be approved officially before you can use that term. But they're all located within that fourth group. And so that's the, that's the structure we can see in the, uh, in the private sector, um, according to our analysis. And given that, I'm going to conclude by offering a few conclusions. Um, Few providers we found offer little in the way of traditional bachelor level degrees. In fact, when we look at the data set we got, it's only about 20%. Most concentrate on sub-degree and postgraduate qualification. And this provision does not leave the uh, sector well placed to offer uh, the competition envisaged with private providers by the UK government. And finally, there's a distinct element of instability identified in the sector. Common provider types um, have distinct characteristics that are strongly associated with the phenomena of market exit, which is not something that's ever troubled the public sector, but it basically means that they, a lot of them are primed or at least look as if they're vulnerable to market exit. These kind of characteristics include whether if they're recently founded, if 
they're a for-profit enterprise if they concentrate on business and IT or have no particular specialization and also being located in London. Um, that's an area of high concentration and therefore high uh, competition between private providers themselves. And I mentioned the Bloomsbury Institute, that shares many, several of these. And in fact, although it was positioned to gain degree of boarding powers, um, it is now um, can't, well, it's not accepting any further student enrollment. So we can see, even if there's a provider that in one sense is exactly what the government was envisaging as a, as a, a competitor to the public sector, it can be vulnerable in another respect, which would be market exit. And so many of the providers, even if capable of offering competition with the public sector, are also likely to be inherently unstable. And I'm going to finish there. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Steve. Um, and that was very informative. Um, I'm going to ask you the you know, a question which takes you slightly outside the terms of the presentation, but um, where I think there'd be a lot of interest in your answer. I mean, how does the UK private sector compare to other private sectors around the world? I mean, which other private sectors are similar and which are different, do you think? Well, it's difficult to say. I mean, what I would say is that it's probably, it, in some ways it's quite, it's unique because it's not subject to much regulation and it's never been very large. What it has been though, is offered a lot of professional tuition and it reflects the interests of professional bodies that demand um, entry qualifications that were never offered in the public sector because they're not regarded as academic, they're regarded as vocational. So it's a largely vocational sector. I don't, the ones I've looked at, I don't see that there's much comparison with uh, other countries which often, their private sectors are often composed of um, religious organisations, you know, um, the Catholic Church might be running a series of universities and things like that, but that hasn't been a feature of UK higher education uh, in the private sector. So I'd say it was pretty much on its own there. And it, in fact, England is pretty much different from the rest of the UK. So it's even, even to that extent, it's, it's different. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm going to bring in David James now to ask the first question. So David, can you unmute your mic and ask your question? Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's very kind. Uh, thanks for that presentation, Steve. It's really interesting and greetings to you and to Vicky um, as well. Um, it, from what you were saying, it struck me that a lot of the competition that these, uh, these institutions may represent is with the further education sector rather than universities. Uh, a lot of the work is sub-degree. As we know, FE colleges do quite a lot of HG work anyway in uh, England, Wales and Scotland. I just wondered whether, whether you'd come across the sort of nature of who they're competing with yet, or if that's something you're interested in looking at. It, it, we are looking now at the FE sector, um, you know, the, the publicly funded one. And you're right, a lot of them are more like FE colleges, but they're very focused and they do, have, as I mentioned, the sign of this vocational element. So that's what you really get a concentration on vocational qualifications, very you know, huge amount of business uh, study. So, mm. and also for people that may have missed out on um, formal qualification, uh, form of graduating from school to another um, mm. uh, education institution immediately and look around for something later in life, not that much later, but you know, a few years where they realize that com um, qualifications have become increasingly important if they want to progress. So it tends to off, offer education to people that are different, slightly older, I'd say, than people who attend the FE colleges, but it's at that level, a lot of it is at that level. And then there's the other areas that, you know, there's the um, presentation was indicating there are other sectors of the, of the uh, of other parts of the sector, you know, mm. that concentrate on highly specialised, like the architectural school, and the, mm. we saw the, um, Royal Academy and things like that. So that's kind of fragmented. It's not all like that, but a great deal of it is, is like, is like the FE sector. Yeah, which of course goes into HE at that kind of level. Okay. Thanks, Steve. You've prompted lots of questions from our 100 participants. Um, I'm going to take them in, in this order. Uh, Claire Callender will be next, followed by Nick Hillman, 
Mike Radcliffe and Veranda Call. There are more on the call list and we'll get to them if we can. So Claire, can you unmute your mic and ask your question? Thank you. Um, Steve, fascinating stuff. Um, I understand if, from our conversations that your categories, your four categories were developed through some latent class analysis. Is that correct? Yeah. What, what I'm curious about is where those private providers that uh, whereby they're, they're, they've got students in receipt of student loans, where they fit within your typology. Because, you know, one, one thing about those providers, those what are 120 of them or whatever, um, is that we know much more about them because they have to register in comparison to the, you know, to the rest of the in, uh, institutions that you've included, uh, the bulk of the institutions you've included in your typology. Yeah. So I suppose what I want to know is, is there anything distinctive um, about those um, private providers that are in receipt of student loans or the students are in receipt of loans, or do they, um, co are they concentrated in a, a particular um, typology that you've outlined? Or yeah. Well, I can answer that quite directly. They I didn't mention the student loans, but that was one of the elements that went into the analysis. I just cut, cut it away for you know, brevity's sake. But in fact, the, the ones that are in receipt of that belong to the second category, which is the more established for-profit private providers, and the fourth category, which is it has the university, the private university. So the first category was the more recently founded smaller enterprises concentrating on sub-degree, and the second the, the third category was highly focused charitable organisations, things like that, um, which don't tend to get um, student loans because they're not teaching those kind of courses that are eligible for them. So it's the third, the second and fourth categories you want to look at, and uh, we can go into it later. Or you, could, or you can look at um, look at those overheads if you get a chance and see what I'm kind of talking about. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you both. Uh, Nick. Nick Hillman. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, and th thanks very much for the presentation and for another excellent uh, one of these webinars. Um, my, my question, it, it links actually as well to Mike Ratcliffe's question, is around the role of the Office for Students, because of course the whole point of changing the regulation was to have a, a, a sort of single level playing field uh, for different providers of different types. Uh, but then the Office for Students got rid of the original idea of having a basic registration category. Um, and my understanding, well, my understanding, and I say this as a governor of the University of Buckingham, my local university, uh, is that there are rather few differences between approved uh, fee cap providers and just uh, uh, approved providers. So in other words, to, to cut to the chase, the new regime was both meant to have sort of clearly defined um, places like the basic category that don't exist, and also sort of hierarchy so that you could become a traditional university, but we've ended up with only two categories and they're, and they're rather similar. So, so I guess my question is, I'd love to know a bit more about how the authors see the Office for Students relationship with this part of the sector. Well, I think to answer, well not perhaps to answer your question, but to give my opinion on it, is that I, the basic category I think was lost because of a reluctance which has been marked you know, for, for decades, I can, I've read stuff from the 1960s um, where they're reluctant to take responsibility for, um, uh, uh, for those providers that they're not actually sort of financially invested in. So I think that's why the, uh, why the uh, basic category vanished. So I think really they're only interested in taking responsibility for providers that they've got no choice about whether to uh, be responsible for and not extending it any further, I believe, because they were, felt that it might be an endorsement for institutions that they felt they couldn't offer any reassurance about. I don't know whether that really answers your question, but if you want to elaborate a bit more. Uh, well, that's very helpful. I, I think Mike's question is quite similar, actually. So I, I, I think we should move on to him if Simon agrees. Thanks for your courtesy, Nick. Um, Mike, Mike Radcliffe. Yeah, so I suppose to, to develop that a little, um, I, I was wondering whether it's possible in your analysis to look in a kind of short term longitudinal sense, because I think those of us who tried counting these things 
at the end of the Hefke DFE designated course period, we I worked out there was something like 850 providers that were getting some kind of government registration and and, uh, uh, and look at at that point. And clearly that's come down to under 400 in the OFS regime and they do vary. So you've got on the one hand, you've got at least one provider that's minute. I mean, it has one of like 15 students in it. It's really, really tiny. But then we've also got some big providers which are now outside that regulations uh, framework because they have franchise students and therefore they don't need to directly register with the OFS. And I suppose my original point was that before we could see that biz and then dfe had kind of a role in promoting new providers uh not necessarily with the greatest success all the time but that's certainly not in ofs's patch and therefore it's just whether there's something about no one is on doing things so if you look uh, at the example of uh, the potential provider in hereford um dfe are kind of funding it a bit but no one is really kind of helping it and develop it so so who has that overall sense of what this sector is trying to do and promote it because ministers have have kind of stopped talking about it as well certainly in the way that joe johnson did so it's just that do you get a sense of that overall thing and do you get a sense of from the data of a longitudinal change say over the last three or four years because that number seems to have come down yeah well i think you're right about the heat having gone out of it I, that's what i detected when joe johnson left it seemed to uh, go off the boil um joe johnson was the minister of uh, higher education for anyone that doesn't know that and he was behind the uh, successes of knowledge economy that I showed the front page of in the, in the slides but yeah, after that it didn't it seemed to lose momentum and I think you're probably right about the numbers that are going to be finally registered I talked to DFE um, and I think they were estimated to be about 120 providers in the end uh, private providers are going to be registered under either of those categories which is just about the same number as they're in receipt of, um, of student lunch, or eligible for student tuition fee loans. So I, I'd see it as a sort of ground to a halt. And I don't know whether there is any great momentum behind it anymore. What certainly didn't happen was any great new investment I could detect. Um, some of the institutions changed hands, but I don't really think there's anything, there's nothing founded um, taking advantage of the changes and making. Um, access to the sector easier for new new institutions. Well, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Steve. Um, our next question is from Veranda Call. Veranda, are you there? If we don't raise Veranda, I've been sent an anonymous question. Hello, is that Veranda? No. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, there he is. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, please. And please ask your question. Okay, sir. Very warm greetings to all. In fact, uh, I was wondering about the private service providers across the globe, because this post-COVID situation uh, is an alarming situation. And should we still think in the uh, micro cost term? India, in fact, I'm from India, sir. I served Punjab Agriculture University, and presently I'm serving as a professor in one of the private university, lovely professional university. And I feel this is the right time that this COVID should teach us a lesson that we should uh, spread ourselves, the clientele, in fact, to the, uh, across the globe and appoint some virtual directors in the private universities across the globe and those universities as uh, Hunt sir mentioned that accreditation is a problem or they don't have the proper infrastructure they are not good service providers but across the globe you will get 1010 good institutions and universities which will like to and cash upon the degrees or enrollment from your country and the top institutions so my sincere request is that let us think the world as one, the whole student uh, platform as one of the globe and provide them the affordable uh, education near to their home. And if these directors, if you will appoint in a private university 
and private universities, if you select as a service providers across the globe, uh, you can choose the accreditation norm and they will provide the skill. But lectures and all other theoretical portion can be covered in a uniform manner by the service, uh, by the uh, universities, which will be participating in that. So this is my humble request, sir. Well, I've got a feeling that COVID might propel institutions already well established to extend their um, their online provision. So that they might be bringing competition to um, providers that were innovative and do have a have the technical skills to deliver it as a to deliver classes virtually. But uh, the, the larger institutions are primed now to do that, and that might become a, a more standard feature. And they could expand across the globe. Um, using, you know, the the prestige they've already built up, and to deliver stuff at a fraction of the cost that face-to-face -face tuition would involve. Thanks, uh, thanks, Brenda, and thanks, Steve. Uh, we've got time for one more, and I've had an anonymous question, which has been on the list for since near the beginning of the questions, and I will ask that on behalf of our anonymous questioner. Steve, the references to the UK, what is your view on private institutions implementing the Higher Education Act in order to reject appeals from students regarding academic judgment? Furthermore, what is your view on higher education providers using marketing style tactics to get students from all over the world before examination results are released by giving them a conditional contract. Don't you think this is binding students to a contract, leaving them in a tough situation if they fail? Uh, End of question. Right, well, it, although it's not really something that's an issue in the private sector. I mean, they're, they're primed to take whoever beats their standards and they, they then can be quite variable. So I think it probably would leave this, but it'll leave the universities in, in a position where they have to make up the numbers if the students fail. So that cuts both ways. And what was the first, what was the first part of that question? About uh, rejecting appeals from students regarding academic judgment. Yeah, I don't really, that hasn't really featured. I've got to say one deficiency in our study is the lack of uh, data on students. So it, those kind of issues don't really feature in what we've done. Sorry to go out on a negative point, but it's impossible to get student numbers from the institutions we looked at unless they're receiving uh, student tuition fee loans. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Steve, look, thanks very much. I mean, I think that you've answered the questions really well and, uh, and we're very grateful to you for your presentation. Um, there's uh, been a number of questions we haven't had time to deal with. I mean, John Anker, Helen Carrasso, Rob Cuthbert and others have, have raised interesting questions which you might address in the chat if you can. Um, yeah. But we better move, I think, to our governance section of our presentations today. So thank you, Steve, and uh, we welcome you uh, coming back as you know when you've got more from your project. Okay. Now I'd like at this point to move across to our other colleagues, Jürgen Enders and Nico Horvath, and they're producing an impressive set of results on governance and changes in governance in higher education in the UK and Europe. Uh, Jürgen is um, a professor of higher education management at Bath uh, and Nico works as the postdoc researcher attached to the governance project and has conducted a lot of the interviews in this program. Um, so I think at this point we hand over to Jürgen and ask him to begin. Thank you very much Simon and very much welcome to our session on the place of the region higher education governance in Germany, Norway, and the UK. We would like to tell you three stories that explore various meanings and roles of the region in the governance of higher education, as well as the interplay between national and regional policies. So overall, our presentation addresses regions in the sense of the subnational in these countries. Our interview-based study has also led us to think about the implications 
of this interplay between the national and the regional for the higher education landscape and individual institutions in this landscape. We thus do not primarily follow the traditional focus on the role of the university for the region, but mostly focus on how the regional shapes higher education. This perspective is inspired by our experience within the CGHE project on the governance of higher education in the UK and Europe. And the inspiration, of course, of Michael Shattock, who is leading this project and has recently published an important book, as Simon already mentioned, together with Aniko, on governance in higher education in the UK. The project allowed us to undertake 135 interviews with policymakers, university leaders, academics, and student representatives. For this presentation, we looked at interviews in Germany, Norway, and the UK. We did further interviews in Hungary and Portugal that we do not use today to reduce complexity for the purpose of a 15 minute presentation. This slide is just illustrating what we found in our interview data based on an overall word count. Obviously, words like university, student or research appeared most frequently in our interviews. Regional appeared, somewhat to our surprise, more frequently than national and much more frequently than global. So moving on, our first story addresses Germany, being a federal country, a natural case for the study of the place of the region in higher education governance. In Germany, all states have their own parliaments, governments, ministries, and the states have in fact a prime responsibility for the regulation and funding of higher education. However, the central government is also setting framework conditions and plays an important funding role. What is more is that due to constitutional roles, the states and the central government have to take care of joint coordination of the sector. This political architecture leads to a constant need for consultation, negotiation, and political compromise. The classical political diagnosis has thus been that major change is hard to achieve and that the most likely outcome of joint federal steering would be the smallest common denominator, sometimes called a decision-making trap. One of the ways out of this situation has been political cooperation and competition, in other words, cooperation of politi political actors in temporary funding programs for higher education. The German Excellence Initiative is probably the internationally most well known of these. As some of our interviewees said, politicians love programs. They allow to show political agility, they generate political visibility and avoid long-term political commitment. Such nationally agreed programs also foster competition between regions, cities and their universities for much needed additional funding and visibility. Our interviews very lively illustrate how this has led to a situation where observing and comparing with the others, other regions and other universities across the country has become a natural thing to do. Having visible and highly reputed universities is not only a matter of national pride, but also of regional pride. 
and a matter of regional branding, including the branding of cities and towns as science cities. As one of the university leaders that we interviewed said, in the past, science had unfortunately left this city. But now the city says, we are a big one and we need science. I was deeply impressed, he said, because if a big city says, well, now we are meaning business, the city wants to make its mark in research and science, then we need to do things. A gender setting for the city and for ourselves. This exemplifies one of the ways in which regional governance is of relevance for the development and positioning of universities. It goes in Germany beyond the traditional role of legal rulemaking and providing basic funding. There's a need for joining forces in the political arena and in the field specific competitions that also influence institutional strategies. Over to Aniko and to Norway. Hello to everybody. Uh, historically, and as a response to Norway's geography, a binary system of higher education was established in the country, with universities and co university colleges developing in parallel. The major urban centers usually had the large, comprehensive, research-intensive universities, while the more focused, technical, vocational university colleges were spread across the regions. The relationship between the higher education sector and the Ministry of Education has been close and collaborative. Some of our interviewees described it as gentle steering, as there has been a long history of consensus seeking and dialogue. While there have been a series of major reforms across the sector over the past two decades, the 2014 structural reform led to the establishing of several new smaller universities that aim to develop distinctive teaching and research profiles. These changes also ended the dominance of the traditional binary divide. One of our case studies, the newly merged university with campuses across a larger region, highlights well how these new universities are in the process of active placement. However, at the same time, because of competitive pressures, they must also delineate their relation to national comparators as well as to the global higher education sector. Our findings show that during this placemaking, intra and extra institutional group making frequently occurs and most mm -hmm. often is framed in regional cultural terms. First, there is a power struggle among the institution's merged colleges, where different academic units often frame their claims based on their micro regional identity. Second, to keep the support of regional industry and administration, there is an attempt to develop a broader regional identity and link institutional branding to that. Finally, there is a pressure to brand the institution at the supranational level to be able to recruit students and staff globally. However, internationalization is then seen by local staff to lead to intra-institutional tension. The other side of the historical binary hasn't remained untouched by these changes either. In our other case study institution, a large urban university, we've been frequently told that the university is a major global player and it develops its strategy accordingly. However, when asked about their more active projects, interview is often told about the increasing importance of local collaborations. As one of our interviewees put it, Staff and students are doing city development projects. This shows the increased interaction with the envi environment around us. Nevertheless, our data also shows the fragility of such a political consensus and the risk institutions take when they adjust their strategies to changes in regulatory frameworks. Currently, there is an ongoing regions debate in Norway, aiming to reorganize the municipalities. Many of our interviewees suggested that these municipal reforms will not leave the higher education sector untouched. As a board member in the regional university put it, these new regions are supposed to mirror the labor market. So it was argued that it might be a good idea that we have a large university in our region, as it is good for regional competitiveness. 
However, with the push for becoming a university, became the increasing pressure to change our programs to serve the needs of this new region. Now over to the United Kingdom. Uh, as the most recent developments in the United Kingdom student admission debate show, the 1998 devolution of social, health, and economic functions to the home countries is very much an ongoing political experiment. Thus, the three minutes discussion of the issue cannot do justice to the topic. It can only attempt to highlight a few major points. For those interested in more details, with the lead of Professor Michael Shattuck, we address several aspects of devolution in a recent book and also in a current article. Devolution for higher education policy meant that the UK government retained control over funding of research, while the devolved governments became responsible for the governance, funding, and direction of their higher education system. The UK government exercises similar powers in England. As a result, the four systems developed in distinctive new directions. Scotland decided to have no tuition fees for Scottish and EU students, but this meant that restrictions on student numbers remained. All Scottish universities are required to be research active. This means that there is a much greater cohesion of the university system, and there is a higher degree of collegiality. Wales adopted a tertiary education system with FE colleges joining universities. To adapt to a declining industrial landscape, a series of institutional mergers have been initiated. However, this happened in consultation with the sector, not by major force imposed by the Welsh SNP. In Northern Ireland, there has been a political storm made for a long period, leading to reductions in funding and matching reductions in numbers. England embarked on a policy of governance via the market introduced higher tuition fees, removed restrictions on student numbers, replaced the funding council with the Office for Students, and encouraged the expansion of private providers. In the following, I want to further reflect a bit on the outcomes of devolution for England. Devolution has often been presented as something that the others, the Scottish, the Welsh, the Northern Irish want, that they are the ones that benefit from it. And indeed, our data shows that our interviewees across these devolved regions do believe that devolution is good and it works for them. At the same time, from our data, it is also clear that England is the real outlier. England would not have introduced its marketization reforms in a non-devolved UK system, as the other nations would have strongly opposed this type of marketization. However, given the number of the cities of the current English system, it is justified to ask whether England really benefited by being able to act without the counterbalances of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. I started the discussion of the UK by saying that devolution is a political experiment which, despite the 22 years that have passed since its introduction, has not been necessarily strongly institutionalized. And the recent debate around the Westminster government imposing a cap on the number of English students that can be admitted by Scottish, Welsh, and Northern Irish universities highlights well how fragile this settlement can be and how strong it has been overshadowed by existing power imbalances. Back to Jürgen now. Um, please move the PowerPoint on, Aniko. Yes, sorry. Right. So, in conclusion, our research points at a variety of ways in which the role of the subnational in the struggle for political ownership unfolds. It points at processes in which the role of the region is affirmed, sometimes challenged and reconstructed. It also illustrates the potential of the regional for the reshaping of the higher education landscape. Altogether, dynamics that unfold within fragile political architectures and contested power constellations. Thank you very much. I want to thank you both Jürgen and Aniko for the brilliant way you presented that um, and very clear and uh, instructive for all of us. Um, and very encouraging story, I think, because you know the regional uh, dimension doesn't get much attention. Um, National politics gets all the oxygen, doesn't it, in every country? And yet this story of regional embeddedness is not only very encouraging um, for the sector, but it's also 
a way forward in terms of developing the sector further. What I want to ask you to start the Q&A is, though, something a bit different. I want you to step outside your data to some extent and make a judgment. Um, I mean, as you know, the sector faces unprecedented challenges. Um, the challenge of managing um, delivery under conditions of COVID-19, um, mm. the challenge of communicating in an honest and effective way with students, in the, given the uncertainties that everyone faces at present, and the great challenge of financial sustainability, which is in every country is going to matter, but it's going to matter in, more in some than others. But it's certainly coming with a rush in the next 12 months or so. Now, this is going to put great pressure on governance. Now, of your three countries, the UK, Norway and Germany, which of them do you think is best equipped to manage these challenges effectively in terms of their governance systems and structures? Um, Simon, do you mean external governance or internal? I really, I'm really thinking about what your you're thinking about that is the relationships you know okay. okay so i my hunch you know we have to be careful here you know that as social scientists we basically know nothing about the future right exactly um, but my hunch is that germany and norway will cope better than the uk especially england um, why would that be so um, I think Germany has, with all the problems this kind of joint decision making has, um, a very solid, stable funding infrastructure and culture. And Norway is a rich country um, where people also join forces to try to manage such a crisis situation. I don't think that the same can be said to the same extent about the UK and England. Yes, just to add a bit to that. So there is one other aspect which I think that will help the Norwegian system, for example, compared to that which we have, for example, in the UK. And it's the flexibility students have to move in and out in higher education and also to move across institutions. And um, in the past few years, it was seen as a disadvantage and uh, there was some external pressure for universities to change that. So, for example, the funding structure was changed and part of the block funding now comes for graduation numbers to universities. But it's still a smaller amount. So I think it's around 25-30% of their budget which comes for the graduated number of students, which means that under the current circumstances, regional universities, for example, can pick up a lot of the needs without students having to, having to, to do major changes to their life or lifestyles. Uh, they can offer a, a much more uh, flexible uh, uh, subject uh, area, many more programs targeted or, or designed for, for shorter participation. So I think that, that in that respect also the Norwegian system might be able to cope currently better with, with what's happening. Well, thank you both. That's most interesting. Um, I'm going to bring in Futao Huang in Hiroshima in Japan to ask the first question. Thank you very much. And a very interesting uh, <coughs> talk. And, uh, Simon, can, can you hear me? Yes, Peter. Uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah, very interesting to talk. And uh, my question is very simple because compared to many European country, countries, and it seems that uh, university students uh, less participate in uh, governance uh, arrangements, especially at the institu institution level. So my question is uh, based on your research, that is uh, uh, results of interviews in the three countries, and are there any difference in students' uh, participa participation in university governance uh, arrangements between the three ca cases? Thank you. Uh, for, for, for the UK and Norway, um, I would say that it's very interesting that if you look at the formal structures, they often can see quite similar. So it's a similar type of uh, representation in the UK. The students have a big role now in, in uh, 
uh, in universities. So they are sitting at the table, they are consulted regularly by the leadership of the university, and it's similar to some degree in Norway. However, for example, in Norway, there is a parallel system, which I haven't seen in any other countries where I conducted research, which is an organization called the Student Welfare Organization, which is completely parallel to any of the university systems. It's, uh, it's uh, secured by law, and it's responsible for all things that are, are related to student welfare. So housing, uh, mental health provision, uh, child care provision, uh, all the types of things uh, uh, that, that they, they might need. But I think that under the current circumstances, because they have a separate budget, which is quite big, and it can be increased, uh, and they have the possibility to uh, build up savings, for example, and, and help students when they are in need, they could, for example, respond much, uh, much better to, to needs that arise uh, and much quickly possibly than, than in other countries. Uh, on the other hand, students in, in both of these countries can, can have a, a decisive uh, argument on how universities are run, or for example, courses, how are changed. So uh, student unions in both countries are, are responsible for that type of, uh, of participation. Jürgen in Germany. Hmm. No, I, let's leave it like that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both. Um, and thank you, Futao, for the question. David Law is the next question. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'd like to reflect a little on uh, 50 years in higher education. I've retired now. Um, one of the things that was very striking about uh, English universities uh, in the late 60s was that so few students lived at home and so many students didn't come from the region where the university was located. Uh, now retiring just a few years ago, things have changed a lot. And that has been accompanied, I think, by a change in, in English higher education by being less provider-led and more concerned about relationships with consumers of all kinds. So my question is, is really what difference does it make when students are to quite a large extent, at least in some universities, uh, home-based students, when their impact on the university is a transmission of the interests of the region through to the university's governance structures, strategy in particular. Hmm. I mean, sticking to the framework of our project, if I would compare that to Germany, we as a traditional picture is what you say we're having more now in England. So students are home-based, they live at Hotel Mama, and there's very little campus accommodation. There is in fact, and I think that's the main issue, very little organizational responsibility for what are supposed to be adult learners who look after themselves. And I think in my point of view, you know, that would then be a, quite a cultural shift um, from a system where you would say that traditionally universities have been much more of um, in place of the parents to look after the kids. Um, yeah. So it will be interesting to see how this develops. Yeah. Um, in Norway, they have a mixed system, and it's again linked to the flexibility, which traditionally the system developed. So you have, on the one hand, the student population's average age is much higher. So, for example, at the regional university where we interviewed, I think it was 27 years, the average age for the students, and in, in the other university, the urban university, it was even higher. Uh, so. It means that the groups have a very different approach, for example, the student, student union looks very differently. So, for example, one of the members of the student union in the regional university was 80 something years old. So the questions, and there are many other people who come back to education. So it means that, that the questions that are posed around this are very different. But also in England, for example, uh, when we did the interviews, we've done several types of universities, and it seems that there is a huge variety between the experiences universities can have. So some of the universities we interviewed that have very local and very, very uh, uh, small region uh, where the students are coming from. 
and that very strongly pushes the university to have a different strategy, to think about how they serve the region, how they engage with the region. So I think that England is changing a lot in that respect as well. We have a note from Claire Callender saying that uh, the proportion of students living at home is, while studying in the past 20 years has scarcely changed. About 22% um, live at home or at Hotel Mama, as, uh, as Jürgen put it. Um, we've got time for one more question, and it's going to come from someone who's already um, asked a question today, but in the previous session, that's Mike Ratcliffe. Sorry to bore you all again. Um, so I, I'm interested in the, the distinctive kind of political approaches of the parties in the UK, such that the, the Scots, um, the government is, is quite keen to distance itself from the English government to take very different approaches to things. And I, I wonder how, and, and the, the clear manifestation of that is in student tuition fees for undergraduates, where the Scots take a very clear view and you know, put up a boulder saying that you know, they, it'll always be free in Scotland. I, I just wonder whether it's as marked in Norway and Germany, the difference between the political parties looking after the, the sub-national devolved systems, because I think that's probably promoted more difference between the Scots and the English and therefore pulled UK higher education apart more than I think if we hadn't had that political dichotomy between those two parties wanting to, to kind of put themselves in different political space on, a, on the only issue that seems to matter to the electorate, which is um, tuition fees for the mobile undergraduates. Very interestingly in Germany, just in, in Norway, um, there was a consensus across political parties in relation to higher education and what kind of changes are needed in higher education. What's interesting that now with the, um, with the plans to reorganize the municipalities, the local, the local regions, there is no consensus uh, anymore. And it's going to impact on higher education. So indirectly, uh, political fractions might actually uh, reshape higher education and what institutions can do. But in terms of higher education policy and approaches, what to do with higher education, there was, there was a, quite a broad consensus across society and across political parties. Um, as regards the German situation, there are two answers to that. Um, they both point into the same direction of having less divergence than you described it. The first is constitutional. Um, one of the reasons of this political architecture is that the German constitution says that the conditions of life should not become too diverse across the country. So this forces constitutionally the different states within the country to talk to each other and to see what, what you're doing, you know, and to avoid that you drift too much apart. The other reason is political. As you know, you know, we have in Germany for quite a while a grand coalition between the Tories and Labour. So, you know, and among bedfellows um, that share the central government, you try to avoid uh, major infighting, obviously. So all of that, I think, contributes to a less um, dramatic divergence in the higher education policies in Germany as well. At this point, I'm afraid we're going to have to close um, the video and audio part of the, uh, of the session. Um, we hope that people who want to raise further questions with our presenters will stay online until about 3.30 when we close the chat. Um, I want to thank uh, Jürgen, Aniko and Steve, our grand coalition for today. Um, tremendous presentations and really interesting work. Um, and we look forward to having both sets of papers back um, for further discussion as more results come out of the research. Um, uh, the governance group has got plans for all sorts of additional books and papers arising from their work um, that's it for today, but we have uh, a further um, session from our CG conference uh, papers next Tuesday. And on Thursday, that's this week, that's in two days time. We have Jason Arday from Durham, 
uh, presenting on No One Can See Me Cry, Understanding Mental Health Issues for BAME Academics, Professional Staff and Students in Higher Education. Jason's presentation has already generated a lot of interest. We've already, we have 200 registrations plus, and we look forward to seeing those people and everyone else who comes in on Thursday. Thanks to all.